Yes, food is the most important thing to uh, individuals incarcerated. Uh, food is used as a controlling mechanism to dispel uh, tension in the prison. Um, it's an area that's one of the most dangerous places in prison is in the kitchen. Because, you know, if one person gets a bigger piece of protein than the next person, depends on who's serving. There's usually a diverse group of inmates who serve the food. And, you know, they may hold a, a piece of meatloaf that may be a half inch thicker for a friend who's coming by. And someone gets a smaller piece, so it could be a very tense place. Um, food is one of the few things that you have to look forward to you know, in prison. And when I was on my job called the Cadillac Crew, uh, I got fired from that job because I wasn't going to the job. And I got on punishment. They put me in the kitchen on pot and pan detail. And where the inmates saw punishment, I saw an opportunity. For one, working in the prison kitchen, you get to eat more than other inmates. You get extra food, you're preparing it. And uh, a couple guys inspired me and they taught me. And, you know, a chef was born, I guess culinary bug <laughs> and I got good at it so it was like the first time in my life ever being praised for anything positive was for the food yeah, yeah that I began to cook well I always aspire to be the best at whatever it is that I do um, I knew that I wanted to be a chef I knew that I didn't want to be fall into the cliche uh, pigeonhole into doing southern cuisine and I knew in order to reach the, the highest level of the food world, I would have to specialize in international cuisine, which I specialize in California French, uh, plus uh, Northern Italian as well. So I knew that the top chefs who were getting the recognition, getting the book deals, getting television, and making money and building brands, you know, they had to you know, think out of the box and learn how to cook food that wasn't ethnic, that was, had a global presence. You know, so that was uh, the drawing part for me. I learned about Patrick Clark, Mark Samuelson, and Robert Gatsby through an article that came out in 1996, uh, prior to my release, about the top African American chefs in the country, which really inspired me to believe that I can become a top chef because here were some chefs of color who specialized in global cuisine. You know, it was a Scandinavian, it was progressive American, classical French cuisine, Italian, Japanese, Franco American uh, foods like that. So I said, you know, if they can do it, I can do it. So I kind of like use that as a metaphor when I tell people who, who grew up, who came up from poverty, who came from the prison system, who came from at-risk circumstances that, hey, if I can do it, I know you can do it. So it's pretty much similar. Uh, some of my heroes and uh, role models outside of the kitchen, most of them I never met, but I feel I know them because I've read their books. Mm -hmm. um, there was a book by, uh, called They Came Before Columbus by Dr. Ivan Van Sertema who uh, used to be the Pan-African study professor at Rutgers College in Jersey. Uh, Haki Matabuti, who wrote a book called Black Men, Obsolete, Single, Dangerous, was one of the first books that I ever read in prison, the first book that someone gave me that really opened my eyes. Mm -hmm. But it was also other great you know, scholars and stuff that really inspired me as well. Brian Tracy, a big fan of his, uh, Robert Greene. Um, so many, so many, you know, I read all the time. I always have a newspaper or a book or something with me. So I'm actually reading a book, too, now called The 50 of Law that came out by 50 Cents, which was co-written with uh, Robert Greene as well, too. Oh, so yeah. it talks about, you know, the mentality of wealth uh, versus middle class versus coming from poverty, kind of like on the lines of Dr. Ruby Payne. She has a book out called The Bridges from Poverty, and I studied a lot about you know, people from poverty and, you know, the value systems and stuff like that. So which really helped me over the years, you know, refine myself and be able to see things that a lot of people that come from my past experience uh, can't see. I had a little chicken business when I was in prison. Since I was a head cook, I sold chicken on the side or I traded it for haircuts or new t-shirts and stuff. So I've always been entrepreneur, you know, driven. And one of the things that I learned early on in prison, I was very fortunate. I was in a federal penal system versus a state uh, where you have a more sophisticated uh, criminals. You know, I was in there with Wall Street Business Mogul. You know, I was in there with Michael Milkins, Codefin, and Ivan Polsky, the Junk Bond King, and Wall Street Business Mogul was a federal judge, and there were stockbrokers in there. And the guy told me once because he introduced me to Toastmasters so I was a part of Toastmasters and we had a think tank in prison we brought the brightest minds together every Sunday we debated religion race politics current events and he says Henderson you know you're a smart guy he says all you have to do is change the product and get integrity and there's no stopping you and that never left me because every 
It's just the people who run this library. They're trying to sell. They're selling this library to the public, saying, "Look, look at the product that we have here. Mm -hmm. Be a part of it. Join. Come here. You know. So food, any type of business, and uh, having integrity is, is was the key, and that never left my mind. So prison was. I just learned so much. It was like I was in college. As long as they had books and smart people, I got next to them, and I learned. <laughs> my reading is, I'm a big advocate of reading. I have probably close to a thousand books in my own library. I have one whole room dedicated to a library right now. Wow. Yeah, and books still in storage. So I buy books, even if I may not get to it for a couple of years. I'm actually reading a, a, a book right now called um, uh, The 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene. Mm -hmm. And I just finished reading a couple books on Brian Tracy, um, The Focal Points, and another book called um, The Art of the Start by Guy Kawasaki. He talks about building brands and imaging and things of that nature as well. So I love reading. <laughs> you know, in build re-imaging myself and building a brand that I had to become a chameleon, you know, to work at the Five Star Five Diamond Properties. I couldn't go in there, you know, with convicted felon written across my chest. I couldn't go there, you know, with the mean face to stare down you know, not being, a, not smiling, not humble, because, you know, a lot of young people and people come from poverty and the penal system and the inner city communities, you know, we don't smile, you know, and we could become very intimidating. And I knew that in order to fit into the circle that I wanted to get into, that I had to look like that circle to some degree, though I am African American, I'm proud to be, but I knew that, you know, if I clean shave my face and set up in a chair straight and learn to smile, which I invested $2,600 in my teeth and I got them whitened and new caps and everything when I got out of prison, because that was important, because yeah. in a prison system now with them cutting back, uh, I don't want to go on a tangent, but there's a little quick point, is that in prison now, a lot of people are getting out of prison with no teeth because they just pull the teeth out now. Instead of doing root canals and putting dentures in, they just take the teeth out. And so that's a barrier uh, to employment, especially women coming out of the system with no teeth in the front. You can't get a job. So I knew the importance of smiling. So what I did is I just mimicked successful people. Mm -hmm. You know, if a chef wore, you know, a certain chef coat, I got it. If the chef wore clogs, I got the clogs. The chefs went and got their nails manicured. I manicured my nails so my hands look good and when I present myself. And I smiled, you know, straight up to where I walk a little bit. So I had to become a chameleon. And I realized that everyone's a chameleon to some degree. You know, we're all different when we're at home. When we're in the professional workforce, we have our corporate professional game face on. So it was like a little acting a little bit. But then again, it became a part of my lifestyle because I knew the importance of, you know, making changes and stuff that help benefit me in the long run. You know, you could be a brain surgeon, but if you don't have people skills and if you're not a nurturing, caring person, it hinders you from doing the things that you're doing. So I'm really into, yeah, really into brand building. You know, you have to be a brand because, you know, here I was an ex-cons 10 years in prison and I walked into Ritz Carlton Hotel, Bel Air, Laramataz, Bellagio, and I was able to get a job. But it wasn't just be, you know, I had to have more than just cooking ability. Mm -hmm. You know, I had to become a brand, you know, the walk, the talk, the lingo, you know, the conversation, you know, I play golf, you know, I build powerful relationships with people in our industry. I put myself amongst the best in the industry. And I have a little thing I call I call intellectual jacking, mm -hmm. where you know I tell young guys on the streets how they jack people for cars and they rob people. Well, I jack for knowledge. So if someone has a specific knowledge or skill set that I need to add to my repertoire, mm -hmm. then I would go there and get a job and get next to that person. Whether I go in as a dishwasher, janitor, doesn't make any difference. Get in there, build relationships, and extract that knowledge and information. A little bit like exponage, a little bit, but with integrity, <laughs> you know. But I do work hard as well. So yeah. <laughs>